Repertoire Podcast. Repertoire Podcast. What's up, folks? My guest today needs very little introduction, especially if you've been in the industry for more than five, six years. But for those that might be new, his name is Harold McGee. He's an American author who writes about the chemistry and history of food science and cooking. He's best known for his seminal book on food and cooking, The Science and Lore of the Kitchen, first published in 1984 and then revised in 2004. He's been the recipient of the James Beard Foundation Award for Who's Who in Food Beverage in America, and his book is in the Cookbook Hall of Fame. And now he's got more hits that have come after that, including The Curious Cook, Keys to Good Cooking, and the most recent 2020 publication, Nosedive, which takes you through why smells and our olfactory senses are so important. I've got on screen right now for the video folks who are on YouTube a picture of a book signing that Harold was so kind to do back when I was a culinary school student. And I've had a signed copy, this book right here, of On Food and Cooking for over 10 years now. And it's what's so interesting to me about Harold isn't the little factoids or tips, because yes, those are extremely helpful, but what I think he and Alton Brown and Dave Arnold and a bunch of other folks have done for us is make it okay to ask why with food. And so if this is the first time you're hearing of Harold's work, I do ask him at the end of our conversation where he suggests folks start with his books. And of course he shares a ton of amazing insights throughout our conversation. So let's talk to Harold right after I share a little bit about New West Knifeworks and more importantly, their newly launched pro program. I was immensely impressed the first time that I saw New West Knifeworks in action and I got them in my hand and I saw how they were made. For those that missed the review on the channel, it's one of my favorite ones in addition to, you know, talking about other knife makers and being able to actually visit them and see how their process is done just adds so much context to why the tool is made the way that it's made. So from their choice of handle materials to the care that they put into each individual knife's edge, seeing all of the sharpeners and and, um, knife makers just go in and individually put the edge on each individual one and, and finish the handle, even coming down to the nature-inspired design aesthetics. They've quickly become a go-to recommendation for me when it comes to American-made knives. If you didn't know, New West Knifeworks founder Corey Milligan started out as a line cook, and so he's got that industry experience cooking behind a stove. And so the knives are not just top-notch in terms of the materials and the manufacturing process, They have the little design details that make a difference when you're eight hours into your shift. What's awesome is New West Knifeworks is rolling out a pro program for verified culinary professionals who are eligible for, believe it or not, 35% off their G Fusion and Ironwood knives. You can visit justinconna.com slash new west or the link in the description of this podcast to register. Super easy, takes less than five minutes. Otherwise, if you don't qualify for the program, but you still want to snag a G Fusion or Ironwood handled knife, be just sure to tell them Justin sent you when you go to check out. I hope you'll forgive me if this is a pretty blunt place to start, but how does it make you feel to see your work touted by literally some of the best chefs in the world? Because when I go into kitchens and see the chef who has the big bookcase on display, there's always a copy of at least on food and cooking there. So how does that feel? Pretty nice, especially given where I started, which was, you know, it's ancient history now. It's back in the 1970s when, you know, you, you really didn't go into chef's offices or into kitchens as a, as a diner. It just wasn't a thing. And neither was thinking about food in a, in a kind of systematic way apart from what people had learned in, you know, traditional sorts of apprenticeships. So the, the change in the food world has been just astonishing in the last 50 years. I'm appalled to say that it's now been 50 years almost. And, and it, it's been, yeah, just a a never ending thrill to walk into someone's office and to see that unbeknownst to me, maybe I was helping out. Why do you think and you you have tons of works that have had so much staying power throughout the years but on food and cooking there was a there was a right place right time right kind of problem solving that it was doing for the audience why do you think if you had to you know hindsight look back why do you think it resonated so much well i i think it was for exactly the reason you just implied which is that people hadn't thought of the possibility of taking food seriously in that way, but people were beginning to take food seriously that way. And I, I feel very lucky to have kind of caught the wave. 
You know, early on, when I was, you know, in touch with people back then by snail mail or by telephone calls, it was usually not with chefs in restaurants. It was with students. It was with people who were learning the business, getting into the business, and wanted answers that their mentors weren't able to give them. And so it was that, that curiosity, that drive to understand because the food world was opening up that made it, that gave me an opening to then kind of present a, a sort of systematic view of that. Would you say that, because that, that was me, you perfectly described myself. I was at Culinary Institute of America. The only thing that I wanted to do was work in Michelin kitchens because, I mean, this was 2010, right around, you know, like 2009, 2010. El Bouya was best restaurant in the world. Alinea had just started to, they had just come out with their cookbook. The kind of talks at, at Harvard, I, I'm, I'm sure you remember those because I certainly remember just binging the heck out of those. And that was me. That was none of what I was learning at, at CIA was kind of tracking with what was being expected from the chef de parties at these kitchens. And simultaneously, I think it was right around the time when CIA was just consulting with Kyle Connaughton to come on and do the food science program at CIA and finally start to develop that. And the place that we would go was the Ideas in Food blog, your book, you know, like th th there wasn't a ton of structured content on this. And so I guess when you think about how education happens now, I just had a conversation with another person on the podcast talking about how the traditional hospitality school is, I mean, he called it dead. Like where I'm not going to sugarcoat it. He called it completely dead and antiquated. And I'm very much so in the camp that the learning should just continually happen in perpetuity throughout your career. Do you agree with that? Have you seen a model that you're like, no, that's actually a good way to get some foundational knowledge and then gain some experience. I guess, can you expand on, on the learning that you've seen happen in the industry? Yeah. Well, it, it, it has changed a lot, and, and I think there have been kind of waves of interest in understanding just the fundamentals, you know, the what are these materials and, you know, what does heat do to them, <laughs> those very basic things. So back in the 90s, late 90s, even the CIA had a course that was designed to delve into that kind of thing. But then they ended up not taking it seriously and uh, it sort of dr dropped away and that opportunity was lost. It does seem to me that, you know, culinary school can do a lot of things just as most schools can. But I think one of the most important is uh, actually to cultivate what you just described, that kind of never ending thirst to understand what's going on because, you know, foods and drinks, they're, they're among the most complex materials on the planet. And you all as cooks are tasked with, <laughs> you know, manipulating them in ways that, that make them interesting, that make them, make them nourishing and so on. No one should ever have the sense that they really understand food and drink. You know, it, it really is endless. And I especially love, you know, Heston Blumenthal, um, a chef I got to know back in the 90s when he was getting going and we've had wonderful experiences together. He ended up getting a decoration from the Queen a few years ago, an order of the British Empire. And this allowed him to design his own coat of arms. And so he took the opportunity, he had to come up with a motto so of course there's a duck on the <laughs> on the coat sure. of arms, but the motto he chose was question everything, and that's the 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 motto that I think maybe all human beings, but especially cooks, <laughs> should adopt, which is to 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 really engage with the things in the world that are important to you, and there's always something more to understand, to appreciate, and to, and to pass on to others. So many threads there. One I wanted to, to quickly just touch on is you're, you're right. Like us as chefs have this, we're tasked often, we live in the how of what we do and so, uh, whether it's time, 
or resources or interest even. Some people just don't want to know about the why. And I'll admit, I, I've used On Food and Cooking and your, your other books as, you know, just-in-time information versus, like, just-in-case information. Because you can just get completely bogged down and there's, there's so much why. There's so much. It's chemistry. It's science. It's, 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 there's a lot going on versus just thinking, oh, you need to cook this to medium rare. And so you have this other quote, which is, while young chefs should learn about the science of cooking, they also learn how to, they need to learn how to cook. And I certainly agree with that. But do you find that there's, I got bogged down in too much book knowledge before doing any hands-on stuff. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you agree there that, that it's better to start doing? And then when you run into a block and you're like, I don't really actually understand how this works, then you do a little bit of research. For the young culinarian who's potentially listening to this, who's feeling a little bit overwhelmed, do you have any insight to share with them? Well, I would suggest not thinking that either of those things has priority over the other. I mean, and, and I, I'm a firm believer in the, the idea that cooks, chefs, they know a lot, whether they know science or not because what they know has come from their experience. And even if they don't know the, the chemistry, they know that certain things work and other things don't. And this kind of process has this kind of effect and different process, a different effect, that kind of thing. My favorite, favorite example of this is, you know, when I started writing about food chemistry back in the seventies, I read in Julia Child that you should use a copper bowl to whip egg whites to make meringues and souffles, you know, egg foams of any kind. And I looked in the scientific literature of the day and I didn't see any backing for that. And so I thought, well, this is probably an old cook's tale, maybe promulgated by the copper industry. <laughs> nothing, nothing to it until I was looking for illustrations for my book, free ones. And so I was looking at really old book cookbooks and I found in an 18th century French book, an illustration of a boy in a kitchen, professional kitchen, whipping egg whites in what's clearly a hemispherical copper bowl. And the key even says it's a copper bowl. So I thought, well, you know, if, if they've been doing it for a couple hundred years, maybe it's worth taking a look. And so I got a copper bowl, which was expensive and I didn't have a lot of money at the time, but I made the investment and sure enough, it's, it's evident within 30 seconds that there's a huge difference. <laughs> so, and cooks have known that forever. Chemists still don't quite understand what's going on. I mean, I did some work with a chemist friend to try to, to elucidate it, but chefs, cooks have a lot of information stored up in their experience. And so adding to that experience all the time is going to add to your, your knowledge and your understanding. And then the science is there to help you make sense of it. But you touched on it because there is a lot of bad information. There's the endless slew of call it like old wives tales or, you know, the game of telephone just happens. It's not even somebody's trying to be malicious. It's just information gets passed human to human and things get lost in translation or, you know, you forget the crucial step of blank, you know, to, to make sure that this actually works or this is the actual mechanism that's making this happen. So yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to parse. It's good to, I mean, you, you use the, the, the phrase in your book title, curious, like curiosity might actually be the driver that people should keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems to me that one way to enjoy both at the same time is to realize that it's okay to be curious without a particular goal in mind or without a particular problem that you have to solve. So when you have a little bit of uh, bandwidth to just to think about other things and to marvel at some of the transformations that take place. I mean, we take a lot of this stuff for granted because especially you all, you see it every day, but if you stop and think that, you know, you, you start with these, these liquid egg whites and all of a sudden they turn into this snowy foam, that's, that's amazing. So what's going on there? I want to take a bit of a transition to talk about Nosedive as, as a book. And I've, I've wanted to ask you this for a while. Do you find similarities between smell and poetry? That's, that's an interesting question. I, I guess what I would say off the top of my head is that smells 
evoke poetic thoughts. You know, they're 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 evocative. You know, they they remind you of other things. They they lead you to make connections that you wouldn't have made in that moment in which you're you're smelling that smell. So I would say it's it's a stimulus to imagination. Maybe that's the the way to put it. And so you know, it's interesting you ask the question. I started out life wanting to teach poetry. So that's why I ask, <laughs> just as a fun nod to your background, and and I I get the same thing. The 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 way you hear a psalm describe what they're getting out of a glass of wine, or you you hear a really good food writer talk about a meal. There's something with language and how they describe, and it's not just tastes. It's like they're they're describing other things. Yeah, that's that's the the interesting thing about smell is that, you know, they're, they're invisible, they're ineffable. And so you have to come up with some way of communicating the ineffable <laughs> to another human being. And you have to use the words, of course, and then those words have to refer to things that are effable <laughs> so that you can, and, and it, it, it's often uh, a matter of searching through, a, you know, a field of words that kind of get you close, but, but they never get you there all the way. Well, because we're just inherently flawed in that we're limited by our language. There's only so many words that we have at our disposal to describe what we're experiencing or the sensation that's happening in our olfactory system. I mean, have you had any tools? I mean, your background in poetry, I can imagine has helped just not just writing, but as you encounter food and you're starting to hear people describe things, I'm a big proponent of having chefs improve their ability to talk about food because even if you don't think that you're going to be this person who does like quote unquote wax poetic about your dish, being able to describe it to your line cook or your front of house person, team member to describe it to the guest sitting on table 12 is infinitely valuable because now anytime you want to run something you have this ability to sell the idea by your ability to talk about food. And so, you know, to the listener who's like, yeah, I think that's it would be cool if I could do that, but I have no capacity to talk about food. Has there been anything that you've seen that's that's helpful or that someone can keep in mind? No, I, I would just I would just second what you're saying. My experience as a diner has often been exactly what you describe. The server will be able to give me a list of ingredients, but you know, that's, that only gets you so far. And yeah. You yeah. went through that era where that was what menus were written as, you know, salsify, beetroot, sorrel, and that's like with hyphens in between. And that was the, that was the menu. Yeah. 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 It, and it, it seems to me that it would help if chefs and servers alike would, you know, go through the exercise of trying to describe something, trying to describe that dish, even to someone who doesn't have it sitting in front of them, you know, but yeah, it, it, it is a challenge and it's always difficult to, to you know, a, again, as a diner, I'm, I'm very often surprised by what appears to me on my plate, even though I've ordered that thing. Perfect transition because, you know, you don't have to talk about fancy adjectives to us. I would love for you to actually break down flavor for us. How should we think about flavor? Well, the way I like, like to think about it is that it's got many dimensions and I, I like to think of taste, you know, what we experience on our tongues, which is a relatively limited set of sensations, maybe between half a dozen and a dozen, depending on who you believe. I, th I think of sweet, sour, salty, bitter, umami, chemisthesis, the, you know, pungency of peppers and things like that. I think of those things as kind of the foundation of building, the, the building being the overall flavor, and then the aromas being the superstructure, you know, what's built on top of those, those foundations. And if you have aromas all by themselves, you know, that's like smelling a perfume, you know, they're, they're not anchored in your mouth, on your tongue with the sensation of, of actually eating. And similar, similarly, of course, tastes without smells are there. There's, it's pinching your nose and not being able to tell the difference between an apple and a and a potato. So uh, that's the way I like to think about it. It's, it's a, a beautiful structure. It's got many 
corners and levels and so on. It's transient. So, you know, the building goes up and comes down again within a matter of seconds, but there is that kind of overall structure to it. Do you have any tips for folks who are, you know, potentially working with food on the daily and they've never actually taken the time to think about flavor or, or, or tasting from the sense of what you're talking about, taking sweet, sour, salty, bitter umami and layering it with aroma? I think most of us who have done any sort of wine tasting know introducing more oxygen into your, you know, as you sip, you take a little bit more air in and that, you know, helps you identify a couple of different aromas that you might not have perceived if you just kind of like took a quick sip and just let that coat your palate and then, and then swallow. Do you have any tips for people to taste better if there, if there are any that come to mind? Well, yeah, just tasting a lot. Got and, it. And, Got it. And, and tasting with attention you know, with a focus on that act. And then I think it really does help to understand a little bit about what's going on as you taste, because it helps you make sense of the, the sensations, which are, which they, which can be confusing because they're transitory. You know, you, you think you're smelling something or tasting something, but then a second later, as you're focusing on it, it's gone, you know, and you have to try and you to... can't bring it back. Yeah, exactly. So understanding, first of all, on the, on the end of the, the food or the beverage, what's going on, you know, that there are these volatile molecules that are actually escaping from the material and getting into the air. And that's how we experience aromas. Whereas the tastes have to be experienced by actually putting something on our tongues and chewing and releasing th those molecules so that they can interact with the tongue. So that's, that's what's going on on the level of the food. But then our brains are making sense of this really complex experience on the basis of what it already knows. It's trying to make sense of what's going on. And so it will pay close attention to the immediate first sensation. And then as it, and this is all happening, of course, unconsciously. So we have no control over it, but, but it, it, it influences what we experience consciously. The, the brain will actually edit and send to our consciousness those aspects of the experience that it thinks are important based on past experience. And so if there's a really strong aroma, for example, once it registers the fact that that, that aroma is there and that it's constant, it'll gradually tune it out so that you can focus on other things. And that's why sometimes aromas can be there one second and then kind of disappear the next. It's not because those molecules aren't there. It's because your brain is deciding for you, you don't need to pay attention to that so much. And that's why learning to pay attention is so important because you can actually override that editing that's going on unconsciously. If you're asking your brain, okay, but I really want to know, is that thing still there? And then you search for it, you'll find it. Call it a, an analogy that I've, that I've heard you use before with smells and it, it really resonated, pardon the pun, but you, you, you've shared that smells are more like chords than they are notes. Can you break that down for the listener and how you might actually be experiencing different molecules and seemingly unrelated things, but they're registering in your brain as, as their own kind of smell? Yeah. So smells are essentially, well, the, the cool thing about smell and taste is that of all our senses, they're the ones that actually give us direct readout of the materials around us, you know, the actual material world. Sight and hearing are very indirect by comparison. And so when we smell something, we're actually smelling little bits of that thing, which are, which have the property of being small enough molecules and light enough molecules that they can fly through the air and into our noses and, and be registered by our, by our brain. And the world, of course, is a really complicated place. There are, if we could actually visualize the molecules around us, there, they would be, you know, uncountable. They would be, it would be like living in a cloud. 
And so we're, we're always smelling many different things at the same time. We're never smelling just one molecule at the same time or at a given time. So that's the, the, the first part of it. And then, and, and that, that's why I use the analogy of a cord. You know, when you smell a glass of wine, what you're getting are a bunch of different molecules from that wine, which overall integrated together, give you the impression of that wine's aroma. And so it's more like a chord than like a single note. There, there is no single note that captures the, the nature of the wine. And then, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the, the other aspect of your question. The well, it, it was just about notes because I think you'll, the, the most striking one for me was hearing about something like vanillin as something that you can smell in not just the actual you know, soaked in alcohol pod of, of, of vanilla bean, but then you'll hear about people describing, you know, like buttery bread in, uh, oaked Chardonnay and you're like, oh, there's vanillin happening there as well. And so what you're perceiving is like there, it, it, the notes and chords thing makes so much sense because I think I heard you mention it in another podcast interview where, and I have it here in my glass, so I'll use this as a, a, a visual. You can't smell lemon. Like it's not a note, like you're smelling multiple things mm -hmm. and all of those notes might be present in other foods, beverages, just plant life <laughs> that you experience out in the world. And the difference between the two, it helped me a lot when I was in, you know, a wine class in culinary school to hear about the fact that, oh, a smell of one individual thing is made up of multiple things and you're experiencing them all together. And then what you've done such a good job of breaking down is your brain then turns it into this emotional, psychological, I remember blank. That helped me a lot because it made it so that I wasn't putting so much pressure on myself to do the, the sommelier thing of just like, oh, can you identify dried red cherries in this wine? Cause <laughs> yeah. 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 So maybe another way to think about it is that, you know, we have different in music, different scales and different notes in those scales, and they can be used to make many different melodies and orchestrations and so on. And the, the same thing is true of the material world. There are molecules in vanilla, vanillin in particular, that give us that, that kind of characteristic note of vanilla. But you can find that very same molecule in other things in the world, in, in wood, for example, or if you, if you're burning leaves or, I mean, just many, many different things. And that's true of not just vanillin as a molecule, but pretty much all the molecules that we find in food of which there are thousands. So that's what makes it possible for us to find echoes of one thing in something that seems to be completely unrelated, but in fact, they do share those notes. Have you ever heard of a pastry chef named Alwyn Boyles? He was the pastry chef of the French Laundry once upon a time. No, no. So I distinctly remember, I had the pleasure of working with him. I th I'm almost positive he's working in, in Tokyo these days. But what was so funny about his presence in the kitchen, and this is touching on a point you made about kind of building that flavor taste repertoire is he would just walk around and go up to your station and you were thinly slicing cucumber or mandolining radish or mixing a cheese sauce together. He would just pick up something off of your cutting board and he would eat it. He would sit there, he would chew it, he would look at you and you just kind of give this, hmm, and then walk away and go do something else. And he was working on pastry and he was, you know, like they have a you know, not limited set of ingredients, but compared to the, you know, eight or 12 courses that come before it. But I, I, it really stuck with me of, I need to be tasting more stuff. Like I just need to be like, be more like Elwin, like just walk around and taste stuff. But he was doing it as like a pause thing. It wasn't sustenance. There was more to it than what he was doing there. And as you brought up, you know, like maybe you just need to taste more. Like you just mean more volume when you're talking about like how to increase that in yourself. And so I just thought I'd share that story for the, for the listener. Cause you, you, that very distinctly, I was like, oh, I associate that story with a person. Like there's someone in my, in my life who I can remember did that. And it really, it really stuck with me. Yeah. And in fact, that, that pausing and that, hmm, is a, 
a great thing to remember. It's something that I had to sort of relearn for the purposes of this book about smells because, you know, we don't have a good word for paying attention to a smell. You know, when it comes to, again, vision and hearing, we, we do, we, we can stare at something. And in the case of hearing, it's the difference between hearing a sound and actually listening to it. And so the, the Japanese have an incense ceremony where it's a bit like the tea ceremony, where you appreciate all the different aspects of the experience of incense, but especially, of course, the smell of the incense. And the, the language, the word that they use for that paying attention is translated into English as listening. And so I, I love the idea of using that term listening to smells because at first it doesn't make any sense in English, but it helps you realize that that's something we don't normally do. And so stopping and listening, not just to smells, but as with the pastry chef, to the flavor of something and, and closing your eyes and really focusing on it and registering it to remember. That's, it's a lot of fun. And it's also, I think, a key to, to really broadening your you're a palate when it comes to enjoying things, but also creating things. The story goes, and the great unfortunate irony is that you lost your sense of smell when you were writing Nosedive. Would you say that you've fully recovered from that? That must have been so, ugh, I can't even think about that. Well, actually, uh, it has now happened several times. Ugh. It was It was much more scary when I was writing a book <laughs> about smell. But I, I did have COVID recently and I lost my sense of smell after, after the book had come out. And yeah, it's, it's both scary uh, and also just takes the, the pleasure out of so much of everyday life. You know, you, you go out into, uh, go for a walk in your neighborhood and there are things that you, you know, by smell the, the neighbors cooking, but also the flowers in their garden, whether they've composted the flowers recently, that kind of thing. But then, you know, the, the incentive to cook, I found just kind of dissipated because, you know, doesn't, it doesn't matter <laughs> what it tastes like. So yeah, it's, it is devastating. And I, I just feel very lucky that it came back. Yeah. I mean, wishing that that comes back in as what is the word vibrant as it was previously. Cause I, again, I'm like knocking on wood that yeah, it's, it's terrifying. I mean, you hear stories of Grant Atkins lost his sense of taste and, and smell. I think it was taste. Uh, maybe it was smell at the same time, but yeah, for, for those of us who do work with food, it's such a, you know, it's, it's how we experience our work. Yeah. And for everyone else in the world, it's how they nourish themselves and, and get pleasure for life. You know, and it has highlighted how little we actually understand about the, the biology of taste and smell. And so that's, you know, if you want to look for a bright side, that would be it. It has highlighted for the biomedical community, both how little we, we know about it and how critical it really is to quality of life. And so people are now paying more attention to it than they had in the past. You have this story of this completely mind blowing moment while you were eating, I think it's grouse at an English restaurant and you couldn't speak for 30 seconds. <laughs> I wanted to ask, how did writing all of your books and putting out all the work that you shared with, with the industry and with the world, how did that change how you experience restaurants now that you've like really dove into working with food so closely? Yeah, no, I, I pay way more attention <laughs> to not only to the food itself, but to the, to the workings of the place. I mean, I've spent enough time now just observing in kitchens and occasionally uh, helping to chop a, a couple of things just to appreciate what an amazing logistical exercise it is to feed people in that way. I had no idea until I, you know, went behind the scenes and spent a few evenings there. So I appreciate that. And, and then, yeah, I, especially when I'm trying something for the first time that what you're referring to is my experience of, of grouse, which I had read about for decades, but had never actually tasted and kind of assumed that it would be 
like duck or, you know, pheasant or quail or something like that. And it, of course, turned out to be, you know, like that to the fifth power. And when something like that happens, when I'm surprised, especially these days, I really do uh, pause just to, to register that fact and to try to make sense of it. And yeah, so that was, a, that was an important moment for me. It's your first day after a weekend, you know, or of your weekend. It's a Saturday morning, let's call it. And you kind of lumber into your kitchen and you're going to make eggs for yourself. How do you make those eggs? Well, I'll probably scramble them with, with butter. Yeah. And do you do like, you try to go super low and slow and soft, like romantic kind of, you know, or American style, like a little harder. Not super soft or hard either one, because I, I grew up. Got with it, the curds it. and I, yep. and I like those, I like that contrast and texture. Is there, I mean, I know that your background is in, in literature and, and poetry and astronomy and like so many different disciplines that you've kind of studied in. Is there a book that's been particularly impactful for you? Cause you've written so many as does anything come to mind as a book that that's helped you? I guess I would I'm blanking out on the name of the book itself. The, the author is Hubert Reeves and the book is on the shelves behind me. I won't, I won't desert you to, to find it on the shelf, but he, he is an astrophysicist, but he's also French. And so he has a way of putting things that I find just really inspiring. And, and he wrote a book about basically the early history of the universe and where earth and life fit into that picture. And that's really where a lot of the first part of my book nosedive comes from is, is in fact, I quote him in, in one of the epigraphs because it's a, a perspective that I think it, it's just a really unusual perspective. It's, it's all about, you know, the origin of the elements and electrons and positrons and this kind of stuff. It can seem very hard science, but he finds the, the poetry in it and the, and the connection to our everyday lives in it. So yeah, he's, he's a wonderful model. We'll find that book and we will put it in the show notes. So don't even stress <laughs> about the name. We'll research it and find it, make sure that people can, can get access to it. Cause I, I love that stuff too. I love astrophysics documentaries and just deep dives into black holes and neutron stars and all of that stuff. Cause it's, it's a very humbling thing as well to just think about the cosmos and how small we are. And it just, there, there's a lot of benefits that come from thinking big. And so I'm right there with you. Yeah. It, it seems to me that it also, as you're saying, you know, it's, it's a huge perspective and then reminds us how small we are and what a brief lifespan we have. But then I think that also, once you take that in, it helps expand the moment that you're actually enjoying, you know, to, to think, wow, we're, I can actually understand something, the universe at large, and I'm sitting here at my desk with a glass of wine or a cup of coffee and enjoying this, you know, microcosm that that macrocosm made possible. So, yeah. Obviously when your, your, your sense of smell uh, comes back and, and you're able to kind of get back into the kitchen, I don't know how much you're, you're cooking these days, but is there a technique that you're still either intimidated by, or you're just like, when I have the time, I'm really going to dig into pasta making, creme anglaise, dehydration, you know, roasting whole ducks, like anything come to mind is like, I don't, I've always really wanted to learn how to do blank in the kitchen. Well, first of all, I should say that I had COVID at this point now, almost two months ago and my smell slowly came back. So I, I think it's, it's pretty much there now. Of course, the, the flip side of that is that our sense of smell does decline with the years. And so it ain't what it used to be, but it's still, you know, it hasn't taken the pleasure out of food. I, I'm still enjoying that and, and noticing things on walks that, that are, are sure. invisible, but, but I know they're there. Anyway, I'm, I'm still wrestling after decades with 
bread. And I know this, you know, pe people have been doing a lot with bread over the last couple of years. I spent a lot of time basically baking every day back in the 90s and thought I'd pretty much nailed it. And then, you know, went on to other things. And then I joined everyone else and th there are just still things about it. The, the thing that intrigues me about bread, uh, because you can make almost any dough, you know, taste okay and you can find a use for it. But what I especially love is the way when you've gotten everything just right and you slice halfway through the loaf, you can kind of see the history of the rise. You know, you can see the story. Yeah, the the bubbles pointing upward. There, there. The, the heat has come from the bottom. The expansion is happening from there, and it's rising to the skies. And then it's frozen by the the solidification of the of the crust. And I used to be able to kind of do that and get these wonderful patterns. And I, I, I it's just way more hit or miss for me nowadays than it used to be. So I'm still trying to figure out what it was I knew back then that I've forgotten or what I just kind of lucked out as part of my procedure back then that, that isn't part of my procedure these days. So to confirm it's, it's, it's sourdough that you're interested or this kind of, you know, yeast risen probably, you know, has, has a proper crumb and you bake it at a high temperature to get the brown crust on the yeah. outside. Cause Bread, I mean, talk about microcosms. Like there's a big like revolution in Parker house rolls. And then if you dig into baguettes and then uh, invariably you get into like making bagels, which is a completely different process uh, to, to be clear, you're, you're sourdough fascinated. Am I well, right? actually all of the above, you know, because they each, yeah. I'm looking for the same kind of thing in all of, well, not bagels, because of course they're, they have a very different life right. history, but yeah, just the, the kind of liveliness that bread can express. That's, that's what I'm looking for. You somehow get a call after we turn the mics off that the person on the other line says, Harold, you've just won an all expenses paid trip to eat at your dream restaurant. And when you get there, there's someone you've always wanted to have dinner with waiting to eat with you. What is that restaurant and who is that person? So many, you know, before it was no thoughts coming through my mind. Now, so many thoughts going through my mind that, you know, picking one. You can name a couple. You can name a couple. <laughs> Let's see. You know, there are just so many places. I, I, I wouldn't go to a restaurant that I've been to before because I've been to, to plenty that have been really wonderful and I would be very happy to be back again. But what I love is actually going to places I haven't been and having an, an experience that I haven't had before. And, and part of the problem there is that I don't know <laughs> what those restaurants are that are going to have that, that kind of magical experience, but I do love, so, you know, there, there are historical characters that you would love to have dinner with the, the people who are alive today. Yeah. Again, if I could pick a couple of people to dine with, it would, one would be a chef named Fritz Blank who passed away a few years ago, but was a member of that original molecular gastronomy crew, had a restaurant in Philadelphia called De Cheminet. And he, so he was old school, but open to the new school and just a, a wonderful raconteur and, and, and someone who could help me appreciate what it was that I was experiencing. And then Heston, who I've known for a long time and who has gone through uh, a lot since we <laughs> first met. And it would be fun again to, to share a forward looking meal with him. I mean, those are the best friends to have because they would probably take care of the restaurant recommendation <laughs> for you and take you to a new place that <laughs> you've never been to. That would probably just be a great, a great time. Last question for you. And I asked this to all my guests, and I, I know that you have expressed that you're on the food science side, you're a writer, you cook at home yourself, but to the audience listening, and because you've gotten so many questions from ambitious, young, I call them hungry industry pros, what do you think chefs can be doing better to help the next generation? Well, I, I guess the thing that has been missing a lot in the past that I think is, is better nowadays, but could always be even better is simply encouraging curiosity, encouraging questioning, you know, getting back to question every, everything we, and in fact, that's reminding me of 
yet another wonderful chef from my past, I think no longer with us, French, who said in French, je sais, je sais, que je sais jamais. I know, I know that I'll never know. So just encouraging the younger generation to not to try to know everything, to realize that it's impossible to know everything. You never know everything. And that's okay. In fact, that's, that's part of what drives you to, to go in every day and work with the same ingredients because you never know what you're going to discover. Harold, it's been so great to speak with you. We will leave links to all of your books and, and any place to, you know, get in touch with you. Or is there a place that you recommend people start if this is the first time that someone who is just coming up and is super young and just gotten into the industry and they're hearing about Harold McGee for the first time? Do, now that you have such a library, do you recommend people start at a specific place? I can imagine it's just follow your curiosity, but... Do you, do you have a recommendation? A recommendation for? For of your books, where to potentially start or buy first or, you know, just kind of deep dive yeah. into. Yeah. You know, I, I would, if you can find a used copy because it's no longer in print, I do have a book called The Curious Cook. And, you know, on food and cooking might be a little daunting. In fact, I hear that a lot from working chefs that it's useful to them. They thank me for it. And The Curious Cook is actually a series of stories. It's, you know, getting curious about a particular aspect of cooking and then following my nose, you know, trying to answer for my own understanding what's going on without recourse to the technical literature, just by doing experiments. So maybe that would be the, the place, the book called The Curious Cook, which I think you can find for, you know, five bucks. Thank you, not just for being on the show, but for making it socially acceptable and industry-wide acceptable for us chefs to ask why I don't just, I know I don't just speak for myself when I, when I say that you truly made it okay, I think for us to say there isn't an answer to this and I'm not okay with that. <laughs> I think that there, there is some more exploring we can do and, and research that, that you can dig into and, and it's, it's helped people like me. So, so, you know, just to say thank you for, for that. And, and just thank you for your, for your time today. Well, my pleasure, Justin. Thank you. I mean, getting to talk to Harold McGee, are you kidding me? If you would have told culinary school, Justin, that this was what my day just was, you would have had to have pinched me because he's such a positive source of knowledge in the industry and his willingness to just chat for you folks is just a joy. And I know some of you folks might be intimidated coming off of a conversation like that, or even just looking at like the tomes that are his books. But listen, these aren't memorization books. That's what I want to want to just jump in here at the end and remind you folks of is it's not going to make you better to individually have chemistry mechanisms memorized and in your back pocket right when you're trying to get up for when you're trying to get set up for service but if you've literally gotten your delegation of your first fermentation project or you are starting to work with dairy for ice cream bases crack this open and give it a read and just start to understand some of the creative and science-based principles at play during your projects cuz that's what I did and that's what certainly helped me and this really helped me wrap my head around why things are happening and so you, then you can take those principles that you learn like coagulating protein or gelatinization in starches or any of the concepts that he discusses in the book and see how they're used in multiple projects across your career. Again, don't come in thinking that you're going to be some hotshot pushing up your glasses and being like, I know why this works. It is important, but it's not the whole picture. And so that's why I like to, you know, give that little context, especially if you're a line cook, chef de partie, you're uh, working with food on the day to day where a little bit of why might actually add another facet to you as a professional. I think that's much more interesting than coming in and trying to be a know-it-all when it comes to food. Last friendly reminder, if you want to snag 35% off your next purchase from New West Knifeworks, you should sign up for their pro program, which is available in the link in the description of this podcast or always available on justinconnacom slash newwest. That's N-E-W-W-E-S-T. 
I really appreciate your attention as always. Pull the outro. Well, well, here we are together again at the end of another episode of the Repertoire Podcast. If this is your first time listening, this is a show for hospitality creators who want to think better, increase their performance, and believe that it's possible to take lessons from what others have already learned. I am your host, Justin Kana, and if you're new here, I'd like to personally welcome you to the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Friendly heads up to check out the show notes inside of the description of this podcast if you want to check out previous guests, links to specifics that got brought up in this episode, as well as other helpful content that we create and share here online because everything we do is focused on helping you along your journey. If you don't have a ton of time, the best place to start is with some value sent straight to your inbox every single week. It's called the Repertoire Newsletter, where we share knowledge on sharpening your skills, asymmetric upside, and exploring the industry beyond the status quo. If you subscribe, we'll keep you up to date on trends that are shaping the hospitality creator ecosystem. We'll share discounts on gear that we find, as well as content that we've been producing ourselves and helpful articles that we've already read and decided are worth worth your time. Last up, if you want to connect with other industry professionals in the Repertoire Pro community, you want to check out courses like Total Station Domination or download free tools that we've created, you can learn more at joinrepertoire.com. That's J-O-I-N-R-E-P-E-R-T-O-I-R-E.com. The only ask from me is that if you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate a review of this show on Apple Podcasts as well as Spotify to help the podcast universe know that people like us like shows like this. Regardless, I'll see you in the next episode. My name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one.